I don't think being stubborn is a bad thing. I think Mm -hmm. resiliency is one of the skills that all industrial designers have just because we're so used to fail (laughs) and not see it as failure. It's just a learning, right? Oh, this is not the way, so I'll do this now. We rebranded failure. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And that's a great thing, right? Like, Like I said, there's nothing wasted. So I think... Learning is paramount, like never stop learning Mm. because you never know when it's going to, you're going to have to pull it out of your Mary Poppins bag, right? Welcome to Talking Design and Engineering by MakeLab. Insights and advice from industry leaders driving innovation and shaping the future of people, processes, and technology in the world of physical products. Hi everyone, my name is Christina Perla. I'm the co-founder and CEO of MakeLab, and I'm also the host of Talking Design and Engineering, which is a podcast all about the people and the processes behind the products we know and love today. I'm very excited to have Daniela Macias here yes. with us today, the Global Experience Design Manager at Colgate Palmolive. And today we'll be discussing her journey going from a manufacturing facility in Mexico all the way to the global headquarters for design here in New York. So welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Hi yeah. everyone. Um, yes, I'm very excited to be here. So yeah. Thank you for having me. And thanks so much for coming in on a weekend for this filming. Oh, totally. It's a beautiful day in New York, so I don't want yeah, to. Yeah, we got, got some good sunlight. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The best full sunlight. So we met not too long ago, actually. We met in March, I believe. Yeah, something like that. There was an IDSA event for International Women's Day, and there was an all-women's panel. And this is actually the birth of the Women in Design New York City chapter that we're both a part of. Yeah. Yay. Yay. Shameless plug. (laughs) And I just remember the panel was so powerful. There was Rebecca, Katie Lim was moderating the panel, Rebecca Pales Friedman, Mm -hmm. you, myself, Emily Williams. Emily and Isis. And Isis, yes. And I just remember during the intros, we all went in depth about our journeys. And during your intro in particular, well, everyone's was really great. Yeah. (laughs) Not to take away. But yours. Yeah. Yeah. But yours, I just remember forgetting I was a panelist, like when you were talking (laughs) about yours, because I thought your career journey was so inspiring. And it's something that I believe is really hard to do, like going from one job, hopping departments, going like going to multiple different offices and really like rising up. Like yeah. that's that's quite the story, and so I wanted to dig in today on and you know give our audience members some some tips and just insights on how you were able to navigate this corporate environment of such a large company, Colgate Palmolive. Right, it is big. It is a monster. Uh, <laughs> it is a big ship, um, and yeah, definitely has been quite a ride. Um, almost 15 years now. Um, my 15th wow. anniversary is in By March. By the way, you can never tell. <laughs> Thank you. Your Thank skin you. looks great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's all that toothpaste <laughs> and skincare. No, but seriously, this is almost my 15th year in Colgate. So, wow. uh, yeah, looking back, I can barely believe, uh, you know, how things have progressed. And, yeah, it feels like uh, I always tell people this has been my only job, but it feels like I've been in, like, at least four different jobs and they keep changing. So, yeah, it's... That's fun. crazy. That's awesome. It. So give us like a brief overview of how you got into ID and how you got to where you are today. Right. So I would like to give you like a quick overview of my career so that, you know, people can get a sense of what I'm talking about when I describe each phase that I went through. So basically, yes, I was hired in 2009 by Colgate. And you all have to know that when I started looking for a job, I graduated in 2008. There was a crazy recession that we all remember. Oh, yes. There were no jobs. And obviously, you know, I'm Mexican from Mexico City. There's not a lot of or there didn't used to be a lot of jobs for industrial design in my country. And so, you know, I looked for a job for over a year. I couldn't find anything. It was it was so demotivating. Finally, I found this little tiny posting for like a packaging engineer junior. It didn't even call for an industrial designer, but I remember going through the description after many, many, many applications <laughs> that I had sent. And I was like, okay, I can do this. I can do CAD. I can do AutoCAD. I can, you know, read packaging drawings, etc. I was like, okay, I'll apply. Let's see. It turns out that it was an urgent, you know, kind of like they had to fill this position urgently. 
And so they called me back immediately. And within two weeks, I was hired. And so, you know, two weeks, two weeks. It was wow. crazy. It was a crazy <laughs> fast process. It yeah. was urgent. And it was also a very junior position. So it was like a low stakes kind of thing. But they needed urgently someone to make the, the packaging drawings. That was like their thing, right? So they couldn't stop that. And so they hired me and that was great. So I spent my first four years there learning inside of, you know, the factory with a team of all packaging engineers, like all men, which was super fun, but also, you know, you never know what you're going into. Yeah. First four years there, my next four years were spent in Mexico City in the regional offices. Mexico is a very strategic place for Colgate, and so, you know, it was a great thing to go there as well, but definitely different. And then this is my sixth year here in New York, so that's more or less those 15 years and how they've gone. And, of course, here it's a global position, and I am leading industrial design for home care and pet nutrition, but dipping my toes in personal care as well and, you know, anything else that I can, basically. I'm so excited to dive in. Like, you really yeah. you really gave a high level just now, but there's so much that happened. Oh, yeah. All it's meaty. Between. It's meaty. Yeah, it's very <laughs> meaty. Some, some, great, some great stuff is going to come out. So... Let's backtrack all the way to the beginning. All the majors, like what drew you to ID in the first place? I love to ask oh this God. question yes. because ID is one of those majors where if you don't know, you don't know. But if you know, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. No, and, and we all do things so differently, right? And we all have different skills and talents. And so you kind of end up all over the place. So that's something that I never anticipated. But when I chose industrial design, I, I just came to it by chance. It wasn't really something that I had in my radar or even knew existed. I think, I, I, I've been trying to remember, I think I started looking into either graphic design or fashion design or something like that. And then it just didn't sound like enough, right? Like mm. I just kept reading descriptions and going to, you know, look colleges and just just researching. And I go deep. I go deep, right? <laughs> and so I went deep. And thorough. <laughs> very very thorough. thorough. So somehow I got, you know, to architecture and then I was like, uh, too much math, I can't. Finally got to industrial design. And the more I read, the more I became in love. I was like, so basically you're telling me I could make anything? that I want. (laughs) So yeah, that, that was it for me. I've always been super curious and just, you know, I just want to know like why things happen, why people do what they do, uh, why things are the way they are. And so I think that's really what, what really drove me to that. And my dad wasn't very happy. (laughs) You know, it wasn't engineering or, you know, being a doctor, but yeah, I, I, he couldn't stop me and I'm glad he didn't. Yeah. And what would you say that you were attracted to ID more so for the creativity or for like the the problem solving or which aspect was it for you? I think for me and I know this now, I get a kick out of solving problems. So I think it was that. I think it because of course I like beautiful things. Yeah. But I, that's not what drives me. When yeah. something just works and when something just like bridges a little gap that was there and, yeah. and it's seamless like that. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh my like, gosh. It's in the details. I was talking to someone else more recently at one of, one of the events in like the past two weeks or whatnot. And we were talking about like how there's some industrial designers where, you know, you give them a blank can- canvas and they thrive off of that. But for me, yes. I need to have something on that canvas to get started. Yeah. Like I need a jumping off point. Yeah. I need yeah. a parameter. <laughs> exactly. You know, and I think I'm the same way I can relate to that because I think if not, I could just go broad and, and keep exploring and never stop. Kind of like when you push something in space and it just keeps going. <laughs> The thought yes. of that gives me anxiety. <laughs> like, yeah, I just had a, no, had a and sweat. I think, I think, you know, a corporation like Colgate is exactly what provided me, right? I didn't know. So I think this is something that, that I don't know how many people this has happened to, but when I was studying design, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. Like, I knew I liked fun stuff that solved problems. So I was very, like, into, you know, like, toys for learning or, like, you know, devices mm-hmm. for, like, disabled people. So, like, things like that were, like, really, like, oh, I love these. But I didn't have, like, a preference, right? I was, like, maybe toys, maybe, I don't know. And it really came down to, like, what I was able to get, right? <laughs> like, what was available and I was right. in the moment and I had the skills. So I think you imagine one thing when you're studying and when you are about to graduate and then reality hits and you're like, oh no. Like, So in a way, it kind of chooses you, but then it's up to you 
what you do with it, right? Right. And so going from, you know, post post grad to looking for your first job, kind of seeing the job market, especially, you know, oh at that time. Yeah. And then going to something that didn't call for an ID major. Like how how was that? Like how did you feel starting starting the job as that junior packaging engineer? I mean, it was a lot of uncertainty. It was like, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know how it would be. I didn't know if I would like it. My mom was like, are you really moving to the middle of nowhere? <laughs> um, because to be strategic, uh, you know, all these factories for big corporations, not specifically and uniquely, but a lot of them are based in the middle of the country. And the middle of the country, there's nothing, right? Like, it's desert, and there's a lot of factories, and there's a lot of trucks, and it's great for those factories. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> for which reason? <laughs> exactly. It's great strategically, but it's really hard to get people to want to go work there, right? Yeah. So for me, I had been one year looking for a job. So at this point, Christina, I was like, I'll just give me something. I'll take it. Like, I know that I can do this. So I think that was that's what gave me that confidence. Just reading through the description of what I had to do, I was like, okay, this sounds manageable. This sounds like something I can do. I trust myself in that. And then we'll see, right? Obviously, I researched like the company, its values, you know, the products that they made. And at the same time, I remember I was also, you know, going for another job. Like I applied to another job for another big corporation and they produce food, right? Like it's like packaged goods, but for food. And I was like, I really wanted that job because I was like, that's a big job, right? Like this company was like 10 times larger than Colgate and like, yeah, the Colgate job sounds great, but like, I don't know. Then Colgate in two weeks hired me, but also my mom, I remember talking to her, she was like, look, I don't know, but like this other company feels like they only have like bags and cans and like, I don't know, like, do you, like, do you think that's something that you would enjoy? And I didn't see it like that. I was going for size and importance and what I thought would be like the most prestigious place to go. But she was right. <laughs> My mom was right. Moms, moms can mom, be very right. you were right. <laughs> and, and, you know, yes. And then Colgate, I, I guess when I started thinking about it like that, I was like, okay, yeah, you know, like they have formulas, they have these products, they have all these like beautiful things and maybe it's fun, right? And, and it ended up being fun. So it was a lot of chance and opportunity and luck, but yeah. Wow. I'm happy I ended up there. There's two follow-up questions I have. One is, I find it impressive that you committed so deeply to something so young as well, right? Yeah. You were right out of school. Commitment's hard to come by when you're young. Yeah. <laughs> Especially yeah. in a job that doesn't match what you thought it would be, you know, in school. Yes. And so what, how did you, how did you find that commitment to, like, do well and to, like, really commit to the job and, like, you know, give it your all? even though it was yeah. so different. Yeah. You know what? And I tell this to everybody, and it is the truth. Whenever I think about that, like, why have I stayed this long in Colgate? What has kept me here? And, you know, kept, why have I kept going? The first week that I joined Colgate, like I said, it was, you know, in the middle of the factory. My window was looking into the workshop, <laughs> the mold <laughs> workshop, so lovely, but... <laughs> Not exactly <laughs> bright or, or optimistic. No, it was it was an office. It was a gray office, but you know the team was great. It was all packaging engineers. But of course, like I said, I was inspired by all these you know products around us, and I was like, okay, so who makes this, right? Like, what could I do here? I could design some of these. Like, okay, so you know who makes this? And so I went to my manager who hired me, and he was an industrial. He is an industrial designer huh? by background or by. Yeah, he studied industrial design, but he, he wasn't practicing, right? He was the um, regional director of packaging engineering, I think. And so, you know, I went to him and I was like, hey, so my first week, I was like, so who makes all these things, right? Like, who designs these? Like, and there needs to be somewhere, someone. And I learned th three things. Um, he told me, you know, number one, uh, this is the team that, you know, lives in New York. It's the industrial design team. There's only three positions. And, you know, they manage, like, the global thing, you know, about structures. And so it's really hard to get there, so much so that there's not a career path, you know. And he told me some things that I would have to do, like, you know, maybe you'd have to become a packaging engineer. And I definitely didn't want to do that. But I was like, okay, bring it on. So from my first week, I think that's when I was like, all right, that sounds like something that could be super, super good to do. Something that I would enjoy doing, sounded like. And yeah, 
just gave me a North Star, I guess. And so as incredible as that sounds, I guess I just threw myself into because, and maybe this had to do with it, the job that I was doing was so technical Hmm. and so dry. (laughs) Like it was so, you know, like it was good because it was very detailed and very thorough and I had to pay attention and I learned everything, like, you know, like like the guts and like, the, you know, everything yeah. inside of what we were doing, but it wasn't the most fun or, or you know, mm-hmm. motivated job. And so I think just hanging on to that as like, well, I could do that. Like, I know I could because I know I have the skills. I just need to figure out how to mm-hmm. get there. And I guess I thought it would be easy or I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I've been getting some Facebook memories from back then. And so I've been saving some screenshots of like just little messages that I wrote about it. And you know, like how it was very cringe, but you know, (laughs) (laughs) you would like publish like your status, right? Like how you were feeling. (laughs) And so I saw one from like 14 years ago and it was like, I don't care how hard it is and that everybody tells me I can't do it. I will do it. And I was talking about New York. I remember that. Oh, wow. And, and yeah, so every time I brought it up, anytime I, you know, I was like, you know, assigned something, I was always like, okay, obviously not asking my boss, but asking myself, how can this get me there, right? So, yeah, I was, I'm, I'm stubborn, I guess. That's amazing. Wow. <laughs> wow. Talk about just drive and commitment to your own dreams, you, you know, know and not giving up. Being in the middle of the desert. <laughs> It's not a lot to think about. <laughs> Zero distractions, only exactly. focus. Exactly. It's all good. So what was your role as a, like, what, what did you do on a day-to-day as a junior packaging engineer? Oh, my God. Packaging drawings day in and day out, all of them. I know all the sizes of toothpaste <laughs> tubes, all the boxes, <laughs> all the bottles. You became a nerd. <laughs> I became a total nerd. I mean, look. Something that I am very proud of that I didn't anticipate is, you know, industrial designers, we we are creative in, in a different way, right? So when I got there, there was this packaging drawing system. It was an engineer making those and using AutoCAD. And, mm-hmm. you know, he was awesome. He taught me what I knew. Um, he trained me for like two weeks and then he was like, okay, now I'm got to do my job right so I was left to it and I remember seeing you know like the the format that they were the template that they were using was just so like it had no information it was not very useful and it was just really like adapting the supplier's drawing to our drawings and then that was a problem because you need all of the drawings you know you need ownership of that anyway it was a whole thing so while I was there for the first you know year I was like learning in etc but over time I was able to just you know start to develop a new template and you know Mm. like just like building a system and like okay what do the packaging engineers need because anyway those would come back to me right and I would have to rework things and they were like oh this is missing that is missing so I developed like a template you know like a whole nomenclature system and it was like I had to do something (laughs) with my creativity and that's what I started to do So yeah, it was a lot of that, but really when things got tricky was when obviously I wanted to to design bottles and caps and all the things that I saw, you know, bar soaps, it's a lot of containers. That's what I wanted to do. So I was always nagging my boss, right? Like, you know, just any opportunity, like just tell me. And like a year into my role, maybe a little more, there was this bottle, a shampoo bottle just for Mexico. It was a very small project because the molds were aging. And so they were going to replace them regardless. And so, you know, if you're going to do that, you might as well, like, you know, try a new design or do Sign something to time. design. Yeah, yeah, it was refresh. like an old bottle, etc. So anyway, there was not a lot of budget. There was not a lot of time. The global team was busy with other stuff. And so my boss was like, OK, if you're up for it, like, we'll take this and let's go. Right. And so I was like, yes, of course. Uh, so I had to do my day job <laughs> and sort of like start working after hours to, you know, do it. And it was so painful. It was so painful. Like made mistakes, you know, it like, it, yeah, it was quite a ride. Uh, but wow. the packaging engineers helped me. And so after that, it was like about eight weeks. The big win was marketing saying like, oh, OK, you know, we, we, we could use this. We could launch this. And they did, and it was like, whoa, okay. It was, I mean, not easy, but I I got it done, right? And so that was like, okay, all right, 
That was your motivation to, mm-hmm. to continue yeah. to get to that <laughs> like, next If I keep milestone. digging here, there's, there's yeah. something, right? There's a little water. <laughs> and that, I think that just really speaks to how you have to champion for yourself and advocate for yourself and totally. like put out, like we were talking about this, like, you know, not on the podcast, but just over yeah. drinks or something. Yeah. And there's, there's definitely something to just putting out into the universe, like what you want and telling people about it oh, and saying, this is, these are my dreams. This is where I want to go. Yeah. And slowly over time, you just start collecting like a lot of champions and advocates on your behalf that want to see you succeed. Yeah. Sounds like your your boss really did that. Yes, he did. I mean, did. he gave you the opportunity. He he definitely, I think throughout my career, it, it's been a theme. And I think at the beginning, it was a very unconsciously done sort of thing, right? Like, I think people see something in you and then they're like, okay, you know, like I, I believe in her passion or I, I believe in her commitment or, you know, oh, she really wants this, right? And so it's like, okay, let me help her. And as I've gone through the years, I've made it more a conscious effort to look for these allies and these mentors and these people that will help me. Because of course, when I was hired, I knew nothing, right? Like my days were like drawings, day in, day out. I went to the factory in jeans and like my Converse, and like, you know, like it was a very chill job in that way. But of course I could, you know, hear what was going on, my, my director, you know, just like what was going on around me. It just sounded so exciting, right? Yeah. Like I remember the design presentations and stuff. And so I had to get close to the people that I thought could help me open these doors, right? Amazing. And so my manager uh, had a lot of good things. Uh, I mean, he did a lot of things that helped me, but he wasn't the only one, right? right? For me, it was like you say, being very vocal from the beginning. Like, I promise you, when I was like, yes, I want to go to New York, I really started to just say it to everyone. Like, <laughs> I, I'm going to New York. Like, that's what I want. Like, and every, it's manifesting. <laughs> every year, Christina, I wrote it down in my... We, had, we used to have a thing. Now it's called something different, but it was like an individual development plan. It was there for the first nine years of my career <laughs> until at the ninth year, you know, New York happened. So, yes, there's definitely something about just telling that to the world, but not only the world, myself. Yeah. Right. Like I remember telling my husband all the time, right? Like, Mm -hmm. hey, you know, like, are you up for this? He was always supportive, always 100 percent for it. It's amazing. And that also gave me just that fuel to keep pushing. Right. And to just have two jobs because it was like 4 p.m. packaging drawings done. Let's just do the other things now. And I just I was up for anything. So that was another thing. Wow. Yeah. Talking about hard work. Oh, my God. I mean, there's no other way. Right. Yeah. So admirable. So admirable. Thank you. So what would you say are like the top things you took away from those four years, like in the, in that, in that factory in the desert? <laughs> in the, it sounds so cool. I love it. It does. <laughs> it really was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think the takeaway was really, it was very technical. So these set down the foundations for my work. And I promise you, I still use that knowledge today. Like Amazing. it's crazy. It's crazy because does it's, it does it give you a leg up? Yes. Being that you have that it on, does. in your in your yeah, in your yeah, library yeah. in your repertoire. It definitely does because I started in packaging engineering, right? And so not a lot of people, you know, Colliet is very big and there's many roles, there's many functions, etc. We're all split up. Our lar- that factory where I was at is, I think it's the largest in the world or something. It's like crazy and it's, it's a monster. It's massive. But not a lot of people can go there and, you know, see it. And like for an industrial designer, it's Disneyland. Like you're in Disneyland. Everything is, you know, getting produced by the hundreds a minute. You know, everything works perfectly. You hear the sounds, the smells. And it's just like just knowing that process and knowing the guts and knowing everything, like sizes, tubes, you know, dimensions, principles, all the tests that, you know, these things had to go through. My partnership with packaging engineering is a critical part of my job, and it has been all this time. And I started there, right? They, they nurtured me, they helped me, they explained things to me. And yeah. so I think that was really, really crucial for me to just learn and understand, because in my so in my university, right, when I studied, of course, they gave me, you know, manufacturing principles, you know, like, you know, processes and what happens, resin transformation. It's basic. <laughs> <laughs> the basics are so basic. Yeah. And yeah. so, yeah, just getting deep into that has given me a different focus and I think a different empathy also for the people 
that have to execute the things on the ground for you, right? Like I'm responsible for my side, the design, stewarding it all the way to the end. But in the end, these these are the people that are going to make it real and make it happen. Yeah. And so I don't think that's super evident when you've all, only ever been in a corporate office when you see the flip side and the realities and the mess and you know the the mistakes the 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 high stakes the the things that get wasted or you know the the things that don't work that's when you really learn okay you know i can do this i cannot do this and if i want to do this maybe i should go talk to someone right like yeah yeah it seems like so you really foundational. Yeah, super founded. It almost feels like if I were to make a, a comparison, it's almost like the design research phase to your to your, you know, yeah. where you are now. You have to know like where you, you learned are. all the foundational basics, all the terminology, you built relationships that yeah. do you still have? Like do you oh my god, Christina. It, that's like people you know, like yes. in the that's amazing. <laughs> that, and you know what? That's amazing. I think it's also it also has to do with Colgate's culture, right? Colgate Palmolive is a company that is very relationship based. And so I didn't know this coming in. I didn't know this. But it has definitely helped throughout my career just to know that uh, there's people that only manage up, right? Yeah. And that's okay. That's fine. You, you get to grow. You do a lot of things. I was never like that, right? Like, I like to talk to everyone and anyone, and I'm just, like, friendly, et cetera. But that, I didn't know but back then, has helped me so much because, you know, even people that were more junior than me that had maybe a faster career than mine and now they're directing something, something, it, it helps me, right? And, and I can go and say, hey, you know, this and that. And so just keeping track of those relationships and, and being just like building that network slowly and not letting go, I think has been super key because again, with the manifesting or the, the you know, this is where I'm going, combined with people that have different answers, different keys, mm. different insights, different mm. whatever, is really a winning combination. And, and yeah, I still have, you know, contact with a lot of those people and not all in Colgate, which is also super exciting, right? Yeah. Like you get, yeah, the packaging and world is surprisingly small. It's almost like uh, also, you applied a very entrepreneurial way of thinking to a bigger corporation, you know, because mm -hmm. when you're an entrepreneur and you're a business owner, like I talk to everybody and everything. I have a very similar philosophy. It doesn't matter if you're a customer or a potential partner or just, right. you know, someone who's excited. I will. I, I like <laughs> to hear about it. You know, I right. like to connect. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think it's, you know, one one thing I'm learning and I've, I have learned more as I've grown up. I was so I felt so stuck in corporate when I was in corporate mm -hmm. and I was in there for just like a very short period of time oh, wow. but what I'm learning is if you really take that entrepreneurial spirit and apply it to like your your mm -hmm. you know within a corporation to your career to yeah. your career there's so much you can do like everyone comes from a different background there's so much you can learn just from your colleagues yeah D definitely and it's not only technical knowledge right like it's also what are they doing in their career how do they manage how do they present you know how do they communicate and and yes like I think I think the core or one of the core capabilities or talents or skills of an industrial designer is empathy, right? Yes. It's and like listening. Yes. it's at the heart of everything. And so I think we're hyper empathetic. Yes. I mean at <laughs> least I know you are, I know I am. Yeah. But this empathy is not only towards our final user, of course it is. And it's to me it's amazing that we're always thinking about the end, right? Like you are the beginning of the process, but you have to look all the way to the end. And at the end, it's your user. And that's amazing. But it's also empathy towards the people you're working with, the people you're collaborating with, the people you're asking stuff from. And because I was at the end of the food chain for, for many years, I understand what it takes, right? And yeah. so I, that has given me really that empathy to say, okay, I hear you. Let's help each other. I'm not going to squeeze you. I'm not, you know, like it's just... I think corporations can be very ruthless and, and in a way, if you don't learn how to work with others, it's, it's very hard. It's easy to get to lost. Do anything. To get like. lost or to even do anything yeah. in advance, right? And yeah. so I have known, not necessarily within my company, but I have known many people that, you know, they might be the best at what they do and they're basically geniuses in their field. But if they cannot collaborate or relate, it's not you know 
It yeah. just doesn't work out. And yeah. so it's, 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 yeah, it's just learning, but also relying on other people. Like there's no other way. Yeah. So, okay. So we talked a lot about like in the beginning, you, you mentioned so many times how you kind of just like kept mentioning it. You were like really advocating and championing. <laughs> I was very yourself. annoying. This yes. is what I want. This is what <laughs> I'm going to New York. I'm going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How, I mean, were you, was that always... Was that always comfortable or was it something you had to like kind of bring yourself and train yourself to do? Because a lot of industrial designers, I feel yeah. like are a little bit more introverted, a little bit quieter. And so I think, you know, that's, that might be an area where people may struggle, you know? Yes. Yes. It's not easy. And I do have to say that I was lucky to find a corporation that has the values that it has and that really encourages its employees to to find new things or to find new ways or to to experiment basically or to do what you want to be doing i know it's not the case for a lot so i do want to say culture is very important and i think that i found just finding a company that aligned with my values was the first thing for sure because then Mm -hmm. it sets the tone for the people that you're working with and how they react to you wanting more or asking for or even just, you know, trying to find your way, you know, in a way. So I think that's the first thing. But also, I think we are too humble, way too humble. It's a good thing for many things. It's great. I think there's not a lot of ego. We're not tech bros. <laughs> exactly. I mean, sorry. It's true. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> it's true. No. And, and, you know, I'm thinking about other industries that I, I, I think are more ruthless. Honestly, I've never been there. I don't know. But I think, yes, I was saying culture is very important. So that's the first enabler. But then also just, yes, it's hard. Yes, it's intimidating. Yes, for sure. Maybe somebody's going to say no. And I definitely got a lot of no's. Mm-hmm. But I've always been very stubborn. <laughs> and I've always been a person that if I'm not happy where I'm at, I, I'm just not going to do a good job. I'm not, I'm not going to thrive, right? And so I knew, of course, that at the beginning I would have to hustle and to like do a lot of things that were uncomfortable and that I didn't love doing. And I did <laughs> for, for years. But I think what saved me was just this like lifesaver of saying, okay, there's this goal. I, there's something here. I can do it. Someone's giving me a chance. I can just keep pushing this way, right? So after that first bottle that I told you about, that was really a stroke of luck. You know, it was like Amazing. coincidence. Yeah. Um, but it worked out. And so the global team was like, who's this person? I'm like, you know, who's, what? <laughs> Who <laughs> what is she? Is, yeah, like, what, <laughs> what, what is this person doing? But it was a good thing because, you know, the bottle launched. It was like three or four different sizes. It's still in the market. It's been in the market for 12 years. Wow. Okay. It's, it's, it's been, it's lasted. And so they called me and they were like, when I say they, it's the global industrial design team. I was. The one you're on now. Dying. The one, the one I'm on now. Gotcha. (laughs) I was dying. But basically the, the director called me and he was like, hey, you know, like what software do you use, et cetera, et cetera. He asked about a bunch of questions. I wanted to sound super smart and, you know, like, <laughs> I totally know what I'm saying. I didn't. <laughs> but, you know, he then, his name was Jay and he's the best, he sent a mentor for me, right? One of his team, I still work with this person. He wow. is my manager, but this person on his team, he sent him to me and he was basically like, hey, I'm so-and-so and I volunteered to mentor you to show you how it's done, basically, because one, I understand now they could just let you know someone do whatever and succeed (laughs) without their oversight and that's fair I I would want that but then too it really gave me all these foundations for industrial design work and so I had to juggle you know all the drawings and the packaging engineering support and everything they included me in like trainings you know like for shipping tests and like packaging things certifications that was great I didn't know what was happening I was just picking it up but I wanted to do design right This ended up being super helpful to me, but the really, really valuable thing for me was that mentorship. Yeah. Because like, you know. That's so incredible. I love that culture. And you've mentioned it a few times, like, you know, aside from this podcast too, like you, you mentioned mentors in the past. And I just think it's so awesome that Colgate really promotes a culture where you can, you can have that. Right. That's incredible. Yes. That's what you want. It is. It definitely is. And of course, it's never without the hard work. It's very hard work. And, you know, you have to. You're being challenged by somebody. Totally. Like, cool. Yeah, sure. You want that? You know, are you at the 
level and then you just go. So yeah, I think culture definitely, the, the company just like how it enables, it has a bunch of programs. That's actually how I got to New York later on, but we, we are not getting there yet. <laughs> but yeah, they have all these programs to basically foster <clears throat> learning and foster just like upskilling people. They have opportunities to like swap, you know, roll. Amazing. So that's really cool. It really depends. I mean, design, especially design, industrial design, is a very small capability. There's not many of us. And so growth is a little harder. Um, but I see, you know, marketers, R&D people, packaging people, there's many roles and they just, it's also a very international company, mm -hmm. right? So we have bases, offices in many countries. And if you want to have an international career, they encourage you to have one. It's hard, but it's worth it. So yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. It is. And did, when you were advocating for yourself, I feel like the fear for other industrial designers is, is being called too opportunistic or like being labeled as like something negative, like it being spun into some, something negative. Like, have you encountered right. that at all? And like, how to, if, if so, how did you deal with it? Or, or w did you, were you able to really build your own personal brand in a way that you didn't encounter that? You know what? I never thought I was being opportunistic just because I was working so hard for it. Yeah. You know, like for me, it was like, something to show. Why would it, why would they say no? Right? <laughs> like, I'm doing so much. I love that. And the drawings that's, were getting that's done. <laughs> right? No one's going to say no. <laughs> How can they? It's impossible. No, it, it was very hard. And, and you know, it's not, it wasn't always a yes. And there's definitely people that was like, you're, like, you're insane. Like, what, <laughs> what, why, like, okay. I think things started, I, I never knew that this would work out. Like, I, I just set myself to it. And then every year or so, I would reassess with my husband and we're like, okay, how are we doing? I don't know. Should we stay here? Should we go? Like, is this, you know, because I, I didn't really know if I was going somewhere. I was just like, you know, trying. I was in the factory. I was like doing things. It was exciting because I was doing design work and I was like juggling these new sort of like responsibilities in top of my day job. And that was good enough for them. So I was like, okay, if, if nothing happens here, then, you know, I have good curriculum because it's called eight. And so, you know. I can build that up and then I know I'll be fine somehow. Like I never, right? And so I think it's that. It's just like trusting mm. what you bring to the table and just being mm. very aware that you can do it, right? And now I look back at my renders and my sketches and my things and I'm like, oh, that's... <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> but look, it worked out, right? Yeah. Like I see and the bottle is still there. It's been 12 years. It's, I don't hate it. It's not the prettiest, but, <laughs> you know, it exists and yeah. it does its job. And so it's all part of the learning, right? And so I, I, I think that everything has been building up and just giving me the pieces that I need. And I didn't see it like that. So all those seemingly void learnings that I would have to take for packaging engineers. Like, why would I ever know this? I'm not a packaging engineer. I will never be a packaging. But now I'm here and I'm like, oh, because this and this. And, you know, you can't do this because of that. And so it's like never say no to learning yeah. anything. And yeah. so I, I kind of like stood on top of that. And then, you know, just like networking and building things. Yeah. I think there's also something that we said about positive attitude. You know, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. like the, the moments that you and Marco really took an assessment of like, where are we? What are we getting out of this? Should we stay? Should we go? Like you were able to objectively really see what's working, what's not, what can, yes. where, where could I move? And so it's like that self assessment yeah. paired with a positive attitude of like, this is what I'm getting out of this. Of course. And don't get That's me wrong. Amazing. There were many times when I was like. I'm, I'm done. Like, I can't <laughs> let, no, I'm going nowhere. Because it's it's hard. It's frustrating. Yeah. Things in corporations move extremely slow, right? And so it's like, there's never a promise, right? They can never promise you anything. And that's okay, you know? Like, you have to do the work. There's definitely things coming. But now I understand at this level what it takes to really, you know, uplift someone or, like, promote them or, like, push them or train them. or It's a whole thing, right? Like, there's development plans and there's, like, uh, high potentials uh, people. And there's, there's a lot of things that go into it that I didn't think about. I didn't know. I was just like, I want that, I want that, I want that, I want that, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, doing the things. Um, so I think just doing the thing consciously and just pushing for it and never letting go, but also being realistic of like, how's it going? 
because again, you don't know where you're going to end up. You don't know if it's going to work out. You just hope it will. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's also something to planning, but not planning too much, you know? But being uh, ready to pivot at yes. any time. I yeah. think that that's it because I definitely throughout, and, and, you know, I'm talking about my first four years in, in this factory, right? Like it was, it started to get heavy because you know I spent four years there I was making the drawings I was like juggling these other you know design activities and I took anything I I ran workshops I did sketches I photoshopped pictures you know like I helped however I could help the packaging engineers and that was adding value but at a point it also felt a little like I don't want people to take advantage of my skills in a way and I want to use them in a way that are helpful you know Mm. that's okay when you're learning but if you keep moving and then there's really nothing and nothing's coming out of it and your skills are not being recognized, then you really have to ask yourself, what am I doing here, right? Yeah. So given that time of like, okay, things move slowly. But to me, the first big step was uh, the, uh, my director transferring me from the factory to Mexico City. And it came at the fourth year. So that felt like, okay, something's happening things are moving, someone's interested in what I'm doing. And so it felt like the first big leap, right? Like, okay, I went back to Mexico City. I got a new apartment, you know, like it was like just a different vibe. It was like setting corporate. I had to dress differently. I had to meet new people. So I think, yes, persistence and patience and hard work, but you can't stay there forever. So it's a fine balance. You have to seek the opportunities. With your instinct. Yeah. 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 And so being that you made two major jumps, like going from the desert, <laughs> yes, <laughs> we'll call it the desert, yeah. the desert to Mexico City to New York, how did your skills required for each position like transfer from one oh my to God. another? I love this question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's a big one. It is. So in the factory, in the desert, <laughs> like I said, a lot of foundational knowledge, a lot of just knowing the basics, knowing what was going on, meeting people, and kind of like starting to learn how things moved, but without me being part of like the political sphere, right? Yeah. Because it's definitely a thing. And, yeah. and people are afraid when they hear political. It's not always a bad thing. I understand, you know, there's there's a reason to run a business in the way corporations do. And I know it sounds ridiculous. There's this lingo, there's all these things that feel very foreign as an industrial designer and they are like it's hard I know designers that have never been in a corporation and then it's just like such a shock right so for me I think what was very lucky was that it was like a gradual nice introduction into that world because at first it was like outside from afar and it was like oh okay and I kind of like rubbed uh, you know like dipped my feet into it when we went to Mexico City for a meeting or whatever so then this this promotion came I was transferred to Mexico City. That was interesting because my boss was like, basically, hey, you know, we're going to do this so that you can be closer to packaging and, you know, to the strategic side of the business. But the packaging drawings still need to get done, right? So that was the first big break for me that was like, okay, can I do it? Yes, okay. But also advocating for myself came in because I was like, I could do it, but it's going to be very hard. And I, I just knew that I couldn't keep up with both if I was going to try to keep pushing in Mexico City. So I negotiated with my manager to hire like a, an intern, to hire an intern. And I was like, hey, you know, like I can look for them. I literally think I, I posted on Facebook, on a Facebook group for the designers <laughs> and somebody replied and she was awesome. Her name was Anna Karen. Now she's in France yes. in for one of our suppliers. But I hired her. I trained her. She was fantastic. She held the fort <laughs> while I, when I went to Mexico City. And so from her, I had another like three interns that took care of the drawings. I trained them all. We wow. evolved the system. Like we trained the packaging. And it was like a whole thing. We implemented in Latin America. Wow. It was... So the drawing things became its own kind of like stream of work and and its own thing and that was 
I'm proud of that, but it's like a very packaging accomplishment yeah. <laughs> thing. So that I could keep going in Mexico City and yeah. sort of like starting to get my feet wet into like research. And, you know, in Mexico City, there's like all these marketing teams, there's like strategic, there's finance, there is a big hub for R&D. There is like all these other functions, insights, right? And so I started going to in-home visits with consumers. I had my first trip, you know, to Guatemala. We went for like a the other end project and we got to go into people's homes and interview them I was mind blown like going from the factory seeing just you know living among bottles and caps and, <laughs> and just you know bar yeah. soaps to going into people's homes and seeing them destroy my design my <laughs> early baby designs and concepts and ideas that we had it was super humbling and definitely gave me like that other side of like okay this is how we make it happen but on Mex- in Mexico City, this is why we make this happen, mm. right? And, and this, is, this is the reason and the mm. final objectives that you have to have in your mind. So super, super interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. You just saw multiple facets. Yeah, exactly. And, and so to a your lot point, more. And to your point, I think nothing has been lost, right? Like it feels like it took very long. I didn't know how long it would take me. Now I can say it took me nine years to get to New York. But I can also say all that knowledge really built up. And so getting here, I know and I see how important these skills have built up and sort of like shaped me in a different way um, to see things in a different way and bring this unique value, right? And so I I never thought it would be like that, but it, it did. And I'm very happy. Yeah. And so what would you say transferred, like, how was the transition going from regional to global then? Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, the scale is just so much more immense. Colgate yes. Palmolive is not a small company. Like, there's it's not. so much scale and so much reach and so many, so much product. <laughs> yeah. I think it's the company, I think it's the second company at a global level that has, like, the highest penetration in homes. That's a lot of pressure. Coke. Yes. That's a lot of, pressure. of course, that's, you know, oral care. And I've never been on the side of oral care. It's, it's the crown jewel, you know, the, the big business. But our other businesses are pretty large, too. And so I think I'm happy that I started in these categories because they are very fun categories, right? I have to say oral care feels like a very different part of the business. I respect it. I see it. It's great. I'm having fun in home care and personal care, and that's what I've been doing. So that's my expertise. Um, And I have to say, they feel very different. So having said that, I think, you know, working from Mexico City those four years and just getting, you know, myself into all these research and, you know, design work. Oh, the the graphic design team as well, right? So Mm -hmm. like other designers, not necessarily my discipline, but just being with other designers, I started to understand a lot of the things that I couldn't understand in the factory, right? Mm. So that's when I started getting more of a sense of like, okay, how does global move around here, right? Like what, I, what is this dynamic with through, between the regions and global? And it's a whole thing, right? Like you hear these big corporations that have like headquarters and then like different regions, right? It's the same for Colgate. And we work in such a way that the global team kind of like thinks very strategically and, you know, there's a lot to do at any single time because there's so many brands and so many things to do. How The regional teams, though, are very execution-oriented and they are very pointed and very targeted and every year they know what they have to do. They run, they go for it, right, and they lead that. So there's something about, like, long-term versus short-term, et cetera. I see. So I think that was one of the biggest shifts, like changing from Mexico City to global is, one, what's at stake, right? Like, it's not the same. (laughs) Yeah. Right. To lead a project or to design for a single country or for a region or to think about, you know, a single brand. And then having to think about everyone and every region and, you know, the largest brands are like, oh, my God, like, you know, when you have to touch it, it's like so complex and so big. And so, yeah, just there's so many people, so many decisions, so much impact, so much money. Like, it's just like what I was leaving Mexico City by a thousand. Right. And so I think I was thinking back in those years, I 
I thought I was ready. I always thought I was ready. I always thought like, why is this not my year, right? Like, <laughs> year, like year for- get me to New York. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember having a very decisive moment at the seventh year in which uh, my mom got cancer. It was like very, it was just like very intense. And I was very frustrated because I didn't see movement. I didn't see things moving forward. I had changed, you know, my manager had changed. He was an awesome, awesome guy. And so I went to this awesome, awesome guy, very frustrated. And I was like, I can't, like if, if I don't see something happening, I don't think I can stay here very long. It's been seven years. Wow. You know, I've been asking it's for courageous. something. Right. I've it's been asking courageous. for going to New York for all this time. And the thing is, there's no, there's no industrial design roles outside of global. So for me, it was like, what am I doing here? At this point, it's the seventh year. Am I wasting my time? Mm. Should I go look for something else, right? That's even a scary thought to verbalize because you committed for so long. <laughs> yes. So like, at what point you, know? you give up? Yeah. 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 And it's like, do I walk away? You know, it, it, that's, a, that's a tough And point. it had to do a lot with my personal life. Um, yeah, it was a very sure. deep conversation with my husband to say, do we stay or do we go? Do I keep trying or not? And he was like, what do you think? Like, what, what's your instinct? Do you think? Do you think it's happening? Because if not, you could do anything, right? Mm. He's European, and so he's like, we could go to Europe and you could just do something. Um, that was very scary too. Um, but again, like you say, I had so much invested, and I think I saw my manager committed to making it happen. He told me, like, I'm going to make everything that I can to make it happen. I promise. Wow. And if it doesn't happen and you leave, I understand, like, I won't hold it to you. He, wow. He's an awesome guy. So he, I don't know, he traveled back and forth to New York a couple of times. And he was like, I'm, I'm, I'm selling it. I'm selling it. I'm doing it. And I was like, I don't know. And then at the, it was, the, yeah, the ninth year, New York happened. But it didn't happen as I thought. It was a short-term assignment, right? Oh, so there's right. this thing. There's it a, wasn't was directly. An it was an if, yes. And I think, you know, I suspect that these kind of experiences for corporations is like a little trial test, right? I, I think it is. I, think I don't so know too. for sure, but I think it is. You would think. Yeah. It's, it's all about risk. And it makes uh, sense. Mitigation. Yeah. Exactly. Like you're not going to... The global headquarters are very different from everything, right? And Colgate is very friendly. The people is great. Like, it's just great. The problem is the, it's just, it's just very high stakes, right? Like there's any single day you could run into the CEO and you don't want to be like in flip flops, right? Like that's, (laughs) that's not a thing. And so I think there's a lot of that just for them making sure that, you know, kind of like you get the vibe (laughs) in a way and you can, you can deal with it. But the second is also, there's so much to do, there's so much at stake, and you really need your top experts to be there, right? And so it's super intimidating because like, okay, here I am coming with like a couple of projects under my belt, right? Like I had these bottles, et cetera, and then I come here and these guys with like a million patents and like, you know, a thousand years of experience just working with the top studios in the country or in the world or it's very intimidating and I think I had never had imposter syndrome until that moment I think yeah I felt very powerful throughout my career and of course scared of course intimidated of course but it never stopped you it never stopped me I was like I always knew I knew more than the people around me, right? Like I was the only designer and that was my power, right? Like I had the skills here. I was among all designers working at the highest level and like, who was I, right? So- Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. So how did you navigate that? So I think the SDA was a very good way to get my feet wet. Sh- short short term, term assignment. SDA, yes. Short term assignment. And Colgate Cole said it's like a development program, something like that, you know, like a talent development program. I don't know if I still don't know how this happens, <laughs> like <laughs> how this comes about. But I do know that I am the first ever the first and only to have made an SDA or to have come on an SDA in the global team, the global design team which is already like, you know, an accomplishment for me. It's like, okay, I was the first, right? So I think they also didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what to expect. And honestly, when I came here, they were all so kind. They were like, I mean, it was a different team back then. Uh, But looking back, like I just never felt out of place. It was more my own fear and my own 
mind keeping me like new environment new country new everything there was a lot of newness totally (laughs) everything and and like I had been asking this for so long at some point I was like what if I hate it (laughs) it wasn't until year nine what if it's the worst (laughs) you only thought that at like year nine (laughs) yes (laughs) (laughs) I mean I had been asking for this, right? I was like, I want to go to Disneyland. I want to like, go oh, to wait. Disneyland. I want to go to Disneyland. And then they take you to Disneyland. Like, oh, do I like the rides? I don't know. <laughs> what am I going to do there? I don't That's know. That's scary. <laughs> it is. Now, I think I was just, you know, thinking about the, 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 the job, the job, what I wanted to do. I wanted to design, right? And I wanted to, to make these decisions. And I wanted to test things. And I wanted to try things. And I thought things could be done better, right? Like, why isn't this like that? I was thinking about the work. I didn't think about, you know, the politics, the dress. So I remember before coming to the, to the short-term assignment, my manager was like, now you have to dress well. And I'm like, I didn't, I wasn't dressing badly. Like, <laughs> but, but to get that was, comment is quite unnerving. Like, yeah. He's like, no, like business casual, like business casual, you know, like, and it was like relaxed in Mexico City. It was at a certain level. So I, I had my clothes and I had my outfits and it was good. But yes, global is definitely on a different level and, and it's a different league, at least for Colgate. It's like, oh my God, right? And so I came here, I was just like, okay, you know, like I'm here, I'll just learn. I was lucky that my team has always been super, super kind and Colgate people generally are, but my team specifically were so nice and so kind and so patient, right? <laughs> and so open to just taking me places and like showing me things and introducing me to people. And I always had someone with me and I always had lunch with someone so yeah it was that's amazing so after those six months I was like this is it like I can I stay like can I I actually love Disneyland just call my mom like (laughs) yeah just tell her we're not coming back Um, but of course it doesn't work like that I did get a little extension. It was supposed to be six months. It ended up being for seven months because I went, usually when there is a short-term assignment, you have to justify it saying, okay, I need to go complete this project or I need to go you know, work on this or whatever. And so I was leading a very big project for shampoo in Mexico and I was like, okay, I'm not done yet. So they extended for like a little bit. We had an extra month, but then I had to go back. So by the, by the time the ASCA was ending, I went to my director and I was like, hey, you know, I really love it here. <laughs> you know, I, I love the team. I feel like I'm part of the team. I think I add a lot of value. And I like, tell me, tell me how I can just be here. You know, like I understand I need to go back, but just tell me what I have to do. So for me, I just took a training and it's about design strategy, right? And there's this question that's like, what would have to be true, right? And it, it puts you in the mindset of like, not against it or what couldn't work. It's more like, how can I make it happen? Mm. And so I think, when I think about that question, and I was thinking this morning about the podcast, I'm like, I think that's what I was doing. I was saying like, hey, what would have to be true for me to come here? What, what do I have to you do? You flipped the equation to en- en- enable and empower rather than yes. you know, make it seem like a mountain ahead. Right. You, you, right. you chunked or it out. Or just sitting down and hoping, right? I was yeah. very clear. You're very active. Yes. Like, I knew this was my shot. And, like, I literally stepped into his office. He was a a French... We had a French director back then. He was super pragmatic. He was a marketing guy. So it was a little scary to go there and ask, (laughs) oh, my God. And I didn't know what was next, right? Like, I got to New York. They gave me what I wanted. And I didn't know if there was a part two, (laughs) like, (laughs) to be continued, right? So thinking about going to Mexico, I was like, what am I going to do there? There's not a role for me. So I was concerned, and I made sure for them to hear that, Something that is important to say is I always asked for things, but I never asked for things like aggressively or like, you know, like in, in, in a bad way. I don't know. I think that the, the, the hardest conversation, one of the hardest was this at the seventh year that I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I need to go. I, I think that was one of the most emotional ones that I've had. But then moving on, I learned that, OK, you know, it, it's fine. Like, it's going to be fine. You just yeah. you need to ask. You need to, you know, be just like in yourself and like, you know, stand in your power and you know what you are and what you bring and, and sort of like stand from there. And so that, I think that gave me like the, okay, I know I'm doing a good work. 
I know, you know, I came, I finalized it, it's, it's going to be great. So I think I have what I need to come ask for this, right? So that was the first thing. I went, I asked. He was super kind. He was like, look, we really want you here. It's just really hard with positions right now. We have to figure out some things. And he told me, like, this famous quote, right? Like, you're running a marathon or a sprint, mm-hmm. so, you know, just you're, you're doing great. Like, don't stop. So I was like, okay, not, not the answer I wanted to mm-hmm. hear. Yeah. But what I did want to hear was, we want you here. Yeah. So for me, that, that's what I stuck to. I was that like, was the okay. win. And I think I, I, I've always done that. I've always been like, okay, there's one possibility out of a hundred. Okay, I'll take it, right? <laughs> like, I'll yeah. stick to it. So I love that. That's what I did. Um, I spent, so I came back in October. So I spent a little over a year in Mexico coming back. This was 2016, the short-term assignment. So I spent 2017 in Mexico City, just working, doing my regular job. As soon as I came back, they gave me a role, an industrial design role, that didn't exist before. But then because I came back, I was doing industrial design, they were like, okay, we'll change your title to this. They gave me a little promotion there. And that was another win, right? I was like, okay, if I stay here, then I, I'll, I have a place. Yeah. So that was great. And I didn't know how important it was until now. <laughs> now I'm like, oh, that's big. They move things for you, right? It's huge. Accommodate you, right? That's huge. In a corporation that moves slow. So a year right. is like short. Right, exactly. And there's so many people. They hustled. <laughs> they did. They, they had did. to go through a lot of red tape, I'm sure, to create they that They responded. For you. Yeah, they responded. Wow. So that's, that's another thing, right? Like, you're doing something, the other is responding. Like, okay, then, then we're, we're on a good track. So anyway, I spent 2017 there, and in a stroke of luck, uh, halfway through the year, in August, I think, one of the three positions, the, the, this guy left. He left to another company, a better opportunity, good for him. So now there was a spot in the industrial design team in New York, and I was like, <laughs> like Where do I sign? <laughs> is anyone surprised? Like, this, yes, I'm here. Is um, anyone surprised? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Like, and so, yeah, it was like, of course, I, I, I kind of knew that it was for me, but you never know, right? Like, they could always be like, well, you know, we're interviewing, and they did. They opened up the position. They interviewed more people. I went through the process. It took months. I had to go through the visa process, which is a topic for a different day, very painful. But we got it, and then in 2018, January, we were flying to New York, and I was, I promise you, people would congratulate me. I was like, this is not happening. It's not happening until I'm on the plane landing at JFK. Like, that's yeah. when I'm going to be like, okay, it's happening. <laughs> yeah. I like that mindset, though. You yeah. know, that's a, that's a very good general mindset to have. I think so. I think so. <laughs> because I always plan for the, just plan for the worst, right? Yeah. <laughs> plan for the worst. What, what's the worst thing that can happen if this doesn't work out? Yeah. I wasn't going to die. I was probably going to find a different career. I just didn't want to get my hopes super up. Yeah. What if they rejected my visa? You were managing your... Yeah. Right? You are managing your, your expectations. I think that's a really that's a <laughs> smart thing to do. Managing my own expectations. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so I think... Yeah. It's a generalized rule of thumb. <laughs> and I, I had been trying for so long also, right? Like anything could happen. Anything could happen. So I was like, nope, I'm not going... And it took months. So anyway, January 2018, came to New York. It was amazing. Wow. The person that hired me, actually, he retired right before I came. Aww. So, yes, I, that's a real shame. We didn't get to work together right after, you know, I came here in the global role. And it meant a lot of uncertainty for my first year. I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I knew what I was doing, but I didn't know what I was doing. Right. I got it. Yeah. And I got, like, you know, just the projects that were left, new projects that came. I just took them. I they were successful somehow. So I was like, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll keep going. And then eventually we got a manager and then things got a little more uh, on track, but yeah. Wow. And so what does your day-to-day look like in this role? Oh my God. Yes. I'm personally so intrigued because again, we talked about this before. And so (laughs) like, this isn't, this is my second time hearing it, but I just think, I just think your job is so interesting because it sits at the intersection of manufacturing, engineering, and design, yes. and like very user focused and marketing and oh, research. That is so yeah. cool. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> you say it, not me. Yeah. Yes, yes. No, I look. I I think this is what got me right. Even from the beginning, it, just the idea that you are creating something that's going that you have to take care of, 
and develop and nurture and steward and sort of like defend it from others. And, and, and defend, defending sounds very negative, but it's not, right? It's just like, how do I make sure that what I think it should be gets as, as much as possible whole all the way until the end? And it's very hard. Designing for manufacturing, it's very hard. And I didn't know this was going to be so important, but it is. You know, when I started, like, oh, yeah, okay. You would think that design is all fun and games and, like, you know, I, I think other functions are, like, oh, you know, like, you know, you're creative, you sketch, you, you do cool things, you have to read the printers. Like, I think it sparks a lot of curiosity, but not a lot of people understand what it takes for designers to really step up and be at, at the level that you need to play. Yeah. Right, so like the product development portion of the yes, job. Yes, and it sounds so I don't know. I, it it doesn't sound like it because you know you're looking at a plastic bottle, you're looking at a plastic cap, you're talking about a bar soap, and it's like what what's there to it, right? Like it, it's soap. It's it's products that you use every day to clean yourself. But if you look around you, everything has been designed by someone, and everything at least should be intentional, right? Like, yeah, and so. Thinking about what I do, it just blows my mind that all the small decisions that I take every day are impactful in some way, right? It impacts the business, it impacts the consumer, it impacts, you know, the, how much we spend because I, I made this small decision and the company is trusting me to make that decision. So it's, it's a lot. I, I, I still can't wrap my head around it. I think it's really cool. I enjoy it a lot. But I think industrial design especially is very obscure in like people don't really know what you're doing. <laughs> they yeah. just know that you're doing something. Right. And then something comes out. Right. Like I see it as more as, as I'm talking to more industrial designers because my career in ID was very, very short before I started Make right. Lab. So I don't have much experience. <laughs> but what I'm hearing is like industrial design is more of the background that contributes to the job function and the job function can be different. But mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. the design thinking portion is really what contributes how yeah. to, to problem solve. It's the problem solving. Like yeah. the bottom line is the ability to come up with a solution that only you can unlock, right? That only a designer can unlock because it's finding a solution by creating something new. And it's yeah. very hard because an engineer can create something new. Our yeah. researchers in, in, you know, our scientists in R&D can create new things every day, all day. That's what they do. The challenge is how do you make it desirable? How do you put this formula in a thing that people will want to buy and then they're going to come back? And, and then on it's such gonna... a scale that Colgate reaches. And such That's, a scale. That's, you know, different cultures, different yes. environments, different, Different like, factories. Climates. Manufacturing facilities. Oh my gosh. Climates. There's so much Yes, to distribution consider. and yeah. like just, just all the abuse that these bottles <laughs> suffer in our before manufacturing before they hit even hands. getting. Right. So my day-to-day, -day, so industrial design in Colgate has evolved from where I started and what I knew industrial design was in my 15 years. I've seen it evolve, right? Of course I have. And it's a good thing. It's evolving for the better. So the general global design team has been upskilling, upgrading, going up in the organization as well in importance and strategic partnership, becoming more of a strategic partner than an executional arm. And it's great. We've pushed for that. It's been like a, a, a community effort from the design team and the leadership. It, it's been hard because, you know, for these functions that we have to work with every day and collaborate, which is marketing, insights, uh, R&D, packaging, engineering, our agencies, you know, that we work with, we really have to make sure to communicate the value of design because design is not easy to understand and it's not quantifiable. So it's very hard to prove that design is the reason, you know, someone is coming to you or that, or it's very easy to blame design if things are not going well, you know, yes. on the other side. Yes. And so it's, it's very tricky. And so I was saying my day or my, my general days is like, there's two different streams of work that we manage now that we've evolved and upskilled, et cetera. It's the design led innovation. And then the other side is the executional projects, like the everyday bread and butter, we call them projects, which are, okay, there's a need in a region, marketing needs a new structure, or, you know, this brand is changing from the structure to a new one, or, you know, there's problems with the bar soap in so-and-so, and we need to, you know, 
change it or modify the design so that it that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. So it's very executional oriented and then the other one is like very blue sky and like innovation and and like dreaming. So it's like a it's a nice balance. An interesting balance yeah. definitely. It it all starts from design thinking which to me is is it blows my mind, right? How you can scale it up and down to solve anything and everything. Yeah. <laughs> And, and I think, you know, the design process is really for us to be able to explain our thinking or structure our thinking for others, right? Mm. So I do a lot of that. <laughs> I do Interesting. Of, storytelling yes. is such a big part of the job. Storytelling, for sure. Because, you know, at this level, all the decisions that are being taken are very impactful and are very important, right? It, it means make or break a business. It means have savings that the business is desperately needing or not. It means, you know, just launching a new thing is scary and you don't know how it's going to go. So you want to make sure. And, and it's a lot of things, right? So I think in in this role, I really have to be able to, to be nimble and pivot yeah. and sort of like speak different languages even, right? Yeah. Because it's a lot of, yes, doing the design part, but it's it's a very small part. We spend time, of course, a lot of time designing and, you know, sketching and looking at CAD and looking at 3D prototypes and just, like, directing our agencies, stewarding the design, etc. But then that's not in a void. We need to take that and put it in a deck yeah. and present it and, you know, convince someone that this is the thing, convince someone that this is, you know, this represents a brand because of this, and, you know, you've set all these foundations, and they sound like they're out of nothing, but they're not, right? You went through a full process, and you have full documentation, and you have insights and research. So I think designers are like these recipients, mm. like a connector, right? Like a, a connector that kind of holds a lot of knowledge and then can direct that, sort of like product design process um, right. and take it all the way to the finish line. Right. So yes, a lot of it is, you know, talking to people, presenting initiatives, you know, just making, I do a lot of diagrams and frameworks and just trying to explain the business side is the hardest for me yeah. because I think design is very, it comes very naturally for me and for my colleagues, right? We can, we're three, so we can very easily get together, critique, 3D prints, critique sketches, change things around, sketch, you know, like do these, do that. We play with AI now. And yeah. So there's a lot of things. Create concepts, run workshops. Like we can do that. It's great. The hard part is that we also have to know about the business and why things happen and why decisions are being taken and who's making those decisions and how you can influence you, the single designer, <laughs> Yeah, trying to convince someone on the other side of the world mm. that's leading a whole brand that, yes, this is what they want, right? Or, or, yes, this is what you asked for. It's just better because we did this. So, yeah, also coming up with plans for research, coming up with how do we know that, you know, what we're doing is the right thing to do. Yeah, There's a lot of that. Um, just thinking very empathetically as well. Um, and this is something, it's a new skill that we've picked up uh, as industrial designers, I think we talk about, you and me, uh, how industrial designers, we really can do anything, right? Yeah. We can learn anything. Yes. And then we go deep and hard. Very well. <laughs> and like... Dive in. You... Yeah. <laughs> like... My world is now X, Y, Z. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Like, that's it. And so I think this curiosity and drive and just the ability to go deep and understand something and say, oh, okay, this is how this connects to that and this informs that... It's really a big skill to have in a corporation because if you can do that with the side of the business, then you have a winning combination mm. because you can win all the design arguments you want. You're, a market is not going to beat you, right? Like you have these, you know, it's your expertise. That's a really good point. But when you're talking about business, they know that, right? Like they see that all day. And so I want to know their language so that I can speak to them and push my agenda. And my agenda is not like a <laughs> shady agenda. It's just like, how can I make the best for our final consumer? And yeah. here's all the proof, right? You're here's advocating for the user. Advocating for the user and advocating for your design, yeah. right? Like yeah. that's, how do I get these yeah. to the finish line? And of course, there's a lot of hard decisions, a lot of compromises, a lot of making decisions about the design that are going to impact the bottom line, that are going to impact the user, 
but in the end, you make choices because that's the reality of the business, yeah. right? And it's not what you wanted, but you find a way to simplify it or to streamline it or, or around it so that you can keep that essence. I think that's what I enjoy the most. Yeah. Like just, <laughs> you know, like the problem solving, the moving, the selling things, the, yeah, all these conversations and, yeah. and just talking about the impact that what we do every day has in the final users is what gets me the most excited, I think. That's awesome. Yeah. That's Seeing really a baby awesome. on the shelf never goes away. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's great. It's like, I worked on this. Yeah. So much yeah. hard work. <laughs> <laughs> and then I always show my mom and she's like, I know, I know. Like, <laughs> just like, she's like, just, just <laughs> I always just go text check on my baby. Yeah. She's like, they're fine. They've been fine all this time. Like, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> you send but your mom to inspect at the store. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes and my friends send me like pictures of like oh I saw this on the shelf or or oh I, I hate this bottle the other day it fell over I'm like I'm sorry <laughs> I'll do my best next time it's, it's just part of that right yeah. and so I think designing for so many people and designing for like you say these crazy scale and capabilities can get very frustrating at times because there's many projects many initiatives and most of them will never see the day of light. Most of them will not go anywhere just because you have to understand that you know maybe that's not the business goal you want to go to. Maybe we can't afford it. Maybe we can't afford it, but then there's no one that can help you do it at the scale that you need to. So guess what? Too bad. Like, let's go to the next idea, right? So, and Colgate is such a traditionalist company. It's so old that I think Part of the of Colgate's success is just excelling at the supply chain mm. and manufacturing mm. and ex, you know like just scaling things up, and this goes exactly against innovation, right? Yeah, and how innovation is it done. It totally does. And so it's very interesting to see how the company has had to shift and and shape itself to accommodate innovation and how design has really been a key partner in doing that so much so that you know we are calling it design-led innovation right so it's like there's a lot of answers that we need there's a lot of things that we want to do and we know that Colgate needs to go somewhere that is new and maybe mm -hmm. it's not the thing that we've been doing for 200 years what does that look like yeah and so that's super exciting but it's so cool it's scary yeah, yeah. But, you know, I, I'm used to be scared, so it's fine. Being uncomfortable. <laughs> Being yeah. uncomfortable, yeah. And then courageous. So. Yeah. So to wrap it all up, we covered, we covered a lot. We went yes. really in-depth. It was really, really, really great. But what would you say are, like, the three main takeaways that someone could get from this conversation? Yes. I've been thinking about those. Right. It's so much. But I think the first and foremost that I want to, you know, people to take away from these is just be authentic and be courageous. Like, you know, just make a plan, whatever that is. It's never going to be perfect from the start. You're going to tweak it and change it and pivot as you go. But that's okay. That's part of the journey. Like, it's never perfect at the, the start. And even if it doesn't work out, you can always do something else right like just try it you never know where anything can lead you and if you believe in it and you feel passionate then just go right courage authenticity takes you a long way number two I think that there's something about just never stopping to advocate <laughs> for yourself relentless really, <laughs> relentlessly and annoyingly <laughs> stubbornly feel, as well yes yes I don't think being stubborn is a bad thing I think mm -hmm. Resiliency is one of the skills that I think all industrial designers have be just because we're so used to fail <laughs> and not see it as failure. It's just a learning, right? Oh, this is not the way, so I'll do this now. We rebranded failure. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that's a great thing, right? Like, yeah. like I said, there's nothing wasted. Even when I think back to my four years that I spent making drawings and I wanted to, you know, like pull my eyes out at certain points. Now I'm like so grateful that I went through that and that I know and then I can speak with authority about whatever, right? So I think learning is paramount and that's the second takeaway, like never stop learning mm. because you never know when it's going to, you're going to have to pull it out of your Mary Poppins bag, right? Like <laughs> I love that. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's how it feels sometimes to be an that industrial designer. You have, a, you have a bag. 
<laughs> and just carry and lug it around. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so the third it leads me to the third point, which is just be yourself. Like, don't be afraid to be unique. And I've had this theme throughout my career of being the only or being the first or being unique mm. or bringing something different, a different flavor. I, I think I never felt scared of that. I think it was more like, yes, I know I can. It was, it was like, I it's believe amazing. in myself. But it's definitely intimidating. And I think as you go, you're like, oh, can, can I? Like, am I? Like, am I on the right track? Yeah. Uh, there, there's always a little self-doubt. But if you can ignore that and just say, I bring value. You know, I, I know my value. I am unique because of all, of all these things. And we all are, right? We all have this special skill, this special talent, this special attention to detail, or, you know, you can imagine anything. You can draw anything. You, there's many skills that I've seen in industrial designers across the board that I know are bringing value to these big corporations. And you don't know how much. You don't know how powerful it is when someone can create something with their hands or when someone can imagine something and create because it's not, it's not what a corporation is, right? A lot of people have many talents, many skills. They do very hard jobs, very hard jobs that I wouldn't know how to do, and they're very smart. But there's power in creating something and using it to show to people and using it for the impact that we have, right? Like just thinking about these things being in people's homes, it blows my mind. And, and it's because we had, or, or an industrial designer, had the skills and the talent to get it all the way to the finish line, and it still looks great. And, you know, it works. So, yeah, just trust in your abilities and what you can do and your uniqueness and everything that made you who you are. It's, it's, it's going to help you. Like, there's, there's no way that it won't. And, yeah, so I, I just want to close with, like, this is, like, my empowerment message for industrial I designers. I love that. Thinking 15 years ago, I used to feel so powerless, right? Mm. Like I think I've been talking about, yes, I, I knew what I wanted and I asked for it. And I, but you know in real life how it happens, right? There's good days, there's bad days, there's terrible days. <laughs> <laughs> there's busy days, there's exhausting days, there's fun days, uh, there's a kind of a wasted day. So it's all part of the adventure, right? And, and thinking about Danny in the factory 15 years ago, I, I felt powerless. I didn't know very well what I was doing. And it, it, it was scary for a long time and uncertain for a long time. Now, looking back, I'm like, I had power all along, right? Like, it, it was my skill. It was my determination. It was my resilience. It was my will to learn. It was my will to connect and to network and to just use those relationships in a positive way and and propel myself where I'm at so yeah it's that you're never powerless and so I, that's that's takeaway that I want you know people to remember from these your power is to be an industrial designer and it sounds so cheesy <laughs> it sounds so cheesy I know that but yeah I believe it so I completely agree I think one thing is how you feel in the moment, and then when you look back at it, and you're like, oh, oh, okay. It's totally different. Exactly. It's totally different. it all makes sense, right? I think it's like a little bit like a video game. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm in a video game sometimes because the pieces just fall together, right? Yeah. Like sometimes when I need something, there comes a person, and they give me what I need, or they tell me the information that I was looking for, or I listen to something. or So it's just never losing faith yeah. in yourself. It's the first thing. Like, you have to be your first believer. But it's also being able to spot those opportunities and spot those moments. Because yeah. a lot of them can pass by, and you wouldn't recognize them as luck or opportunity unless you're, oh, yeah. you're, you're, you have that door propped open. You're and you're, right. you're accepting it. You and are so very right. It's a lot about perspective. It is. But, and, and, you know, again, it's hard work for sure. It's yeah. the first thing for sure, a plan for sure. But then opportunity, a little luck, and just going for it. Like, yeah. what would, what's the worst that can happen? Yeah. Right? And then you find out. <laughs> There's only one way to find out. <laughs> you fail forward. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. yeah. Well, 
Thank you so much for coming. This has been such a really great podcast. I'm so excited I'm for this so to come out. I'm so happy we finally did it. I know. <laughs> I know. And no. right before you left, too. Thank but. you so much for having me. This, yeah. this is fantastic. And you know I can talk to you for hours and hours. Oh, yes. So, this you know. could be a four-hour long exactly. episode. Exactly. Really exactly. I don't know that that's the best thing for everyone, <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll continue this offline. <laughs> don't worry. Well, thank you for joining in, and thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Subscribe to Talking Design and Engineering on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube, or follow MakeLab on social media for the latest in on-demand 3D printing services.